We'll be starting up here in about two minutes, so if you want to take your seat, we encourage you to move to the front because we're not a big group. So if you want to move to the front, that'd be great. Thank you. Al, can you hear me? Al, can you hear me? Yes. 
You don't know the person next to you that you know them? They're all other people. hear me. Yeah, your love and support has meant everything to us. Uh, we've had so many prayers that have buoyed us up. There's an unrelenting love here at Madison campus, which uh, everyone who saw us hugged us, and the only question you usually had was, what can we do? And, and you really meant it. It wasn't like you were just saying to fake it, so we loved it. Uh, we thank Pastor Nathan and Pastor Julie for being here and participating with us and their love and support. Pastor Julie was the first one to call me, and Pastor Nathan soon thereafter, so it was wonderful. Um, our church family, uh, if you look around and you don't know someone, it's probably from 
the Sabbath school class or the 403 or some of them are like Vonda's, Vonda's dear sister and her husband are here. Uh, you might not, but he, they've been members here for many years before they went to, uh, I want to say Portland Church, but yeah, in that area. So we just appreciate so much everyone here. The deaconesses uh, have, are going out of their way to make a meal for us afterwards. And I think that'd be a great time for us to spend, to share with each other a little more after all this, everything we talk about today. Behind the scenes, David Hamburger's up there. We put him through quite a trial this morning, try to get things to work. Uh, Penny and John, thank you for coming early to help me set up and get things organized. Claudette Denny, thank you for making sure that our class sent, sent these wonderful plants for us. I love it. Uh, there's so many others that are helping out. And I want to thank Pete. Pete, thank you for driving up with Dennis. I know that he, he really appreciated. This is Pete. And if, and if you want a great story, Pete has it. <laughs> so it's great. So we have Dennis, Carol's husband here, love of her life, Dennis. Uh, we have Charles, Dennis's brother, is back there, along with his son, Kyle. Uh, we have Cousin Sue, where are you sitting, Cousin Sue? There you are, along with uh, her husband, Al. Cousin Sue has, the, been, has one of the great titles of knowing Carol longer than anyone else here. So, uh, my son, Nicholas, and, and we have uh, his wife, Heidi, my daughter, Autumn, and uh, his husband, <laughs> her, her husband, Shane. Uh, Nicholas and Autumn both had the benefit of meeting Carol before they can remember. But the good thing is, we have pictures, and you'll see some of them. And they're, they're children. We have, uh, they're also known as the favorite five. They'll be singing for you later. Uh, and they also met Carol before they can remember, and we still have pictures. Most of their memories of Carol come from stories we told them. So we'll see how that goes in the future, but it's a, it's a great thing. By the way, Autumn, if you just stand up, we'll get this out of the way right now. Everyone says when we look at Carol, Autumn looks just like her. So the answer is yes. <laughs> and in our family, it's been Autumn's obviously the daughter that Carol didn't have. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, today, we hope to celebrate Carol, uh, but more importantly, to celebrate the fact that she was a Christian, and she met Jesus, and she trusted in him. So we celebrate the certainty of the great reunion, the resurrection. So pay attention to what you see today, because Someday in the future, you may sit down in the New Jerusalem and you'll say, hey, you're Carol. I sat down with a lot of people who loved you and they told me all sorts of stories and I learned to love you too. And you'll both talk and you'll say, boy, these lights are beautiful because she loved lights. The colors are beautiful because she loved colors. And you'll praise the Lord and then my fear will happen. She'll say, let me tell you about the real Charlie. Don't believe her. <laughs> when Jesus talked about the great reunion day, he often used celebrations like wedding feasts as a venue for his stories. So today it is fitting that we gather together today as we look forward to the great reunion celebration with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Are you guys up next?
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Today, I want to walk with God in his city. Yes, it is beautiful beyond beauty, and the light that comes from God is filling every void and reflecting off all manner of precious stones and refined metals so pure the light passes through them. But that's not why I want to walk in God's city today. Yes, it's filled with people who have joy on their faces, loving words on their lips, and praises for a God who has saved them. People who no longer live under sin and death, pain or sorrow, sickness and selfishness. They have been completely transformed in every way. They also reflect God's light like precious stones and yet God's light passes through them unto others. And love is everywhere to be found. But that's not why I want to talk with God and walk with him in God's city. Today, I want to walk with God in this city because I need to be with my loving Lord, my friend, the lover of my soul, the one who is always for me, always puts his arms around me, the one who fully understands me, knows me, and loves me, the only one whose comforting is complete and lasting and whose hope is sure. His door is open, and as I approach, it is like all the pleasant memories I hold dear, explode in my heart, and my mood soars high, anticipating coming into his presence. 
He invites me in, hugging me, comforting me, confirming his love and joy. I want to walk in God's holy city today because he is there. I need to walk with God to be surrounded by his warmth, his light, his love. He wipes away every tear, and I am thankful that God's door is always open. My brother, Victor, will be doing the scripture reading. People have said he looks a little bit like me. That's because he's so handsome, right? Yeah. Well, that's kind of a backwards thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I really love this book. Uh, how much truth can you find in the world today? How much truth can you find in the world today? Not much. And you don't know what's true and what isn't. But this is true. And uh, <clears throat> Carol's not done yet. You know, the Bible says that she's sleeping. And there's a time that will come when she's not sleeping. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, if we want to go in, into the Bible, to find out what really happens, you, you, look, you look in the, in the book, right? 1 Thessalonians 4, starting at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So Carol's sleeping in Jesus. 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the one. There's a gospel song that says, if I ever needed the Lord, I sure do need him now. I believe that and pray some form of that every day, but these are days when we know we want to see God, we want him to touch us, we want his unconditional love wrapped around us. So with that desire, pray with me. Oh, Lord, we are so grateful that your ears are always open, that you've asked us to call and request with thanksgiving. And so we're doing that. Much thanks for the life of Carol. Much thanks for the lives we each have to go on with. Much thanks for all who have preceded us and especially those who have trusted you and set an example for that. But even hearts full of trust and hope and confidence quiver when they are left lonely. And that is this family now. I thank you that you're the compassionate father who was also touched with the feelings and infirmities that we have. You showed us how to walk, and we watch and read and listen and wonder how to be more like Jesus. Just let it be, Lord. Use all of these things to draw us deeper and more convicted and more sure that you are the Father who keeps his promises, who sees us through the author of our faith and the finisher. Yes, for Carol and for each of us. So wrap your arms around these hearts, Lord, today. Your faithful, loving, righteous right arm. Thank you, because you promised it and it's true. Amen. Is this the right one? Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to read a poem that my father wrote. Uh, it's a poem that he wrote for his sister, and it's a poem that he wrote for the hope we have in Christ. And uh, I am grateful for that hope we have, and I am also very grateful to have known and been able to spend a lot of time with my Aunt Carol. It's called, Now I Have Another Reason. My heart lifted higher the moment I met Jesus and I look forward to every moment I have with him. There is nothing like knowing Jesus has me in his arms, but now I have another reason to look forward to being with him. I look forward with anticipation to becoming closer to Jesus. I heard him as he knocked and called for me to open the door. Hallelujah, I accepted his invitation and am forgiven, but now, I have another reason to open the door. What will it be like to see Jesus face to face when Jesus calls us up to meet him in the sky? What a day that will be as we meet Jesus. 
But now I have another reason to join him in the sky. We do not know what beauty God has for us. We are thankful that Jesus made a place for us in his city where God's light and love will shine on us and through us. But now I have another reason to be in his city. God drew us to him with his everlasting kindness. In the book of life, our names are written there. And he used you to send his kindness to me. So when the roll is called up yonder, we'll be there. Hello. Hello. I like this one. Okay. Yeah, in the, in the program, you might have noticed that I messed up, but that's okay. Because the kids are supposed to be singing the role of Call of the Under now, which is why they were so confused when I asked them to come up earlier. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is a life sketch. Uh, I've heard from Dennis that he has some things that I don't know about, so I wait for his little addition later on. My sister, Carol, Carol Kassaraskas, was born Carol Jean Hayes in July 27, 1947. She was a, a baby boomer, leading the baby boomer age, so she was right up front, leading the way. She was born to Jean Dauber and Victor Hayes who met at a USO show during World War II. She was at Ohio Wesleyan when she heard the Pearl Harbor was attacked. My father, Victor, was out at sea on the USS Enterprise that was stationed at Pearl Harbor, but was not in port at the time. She told me that when she saw my father, he just looked so handsome in his uniform. And I could tell she meant it when she said it. <laughs> and she said her mother loved the fact that he was six foot six, had big arms, and could just engulf her in his arms. And she loved that. Carol was the first of four children. Two years afterwards, Victor was born. Three years after that, I was born. And then five years later, Bonnie was born. Cousin Sue was about Carol's age. And so they uh, really sort of were like sisters anyway when they played together. She was born to my mother's sister, Doris, Aunt Doris. And there was, Sue and, Victor and Carol were very close. Victor and Sue are both here today, which I'm thankful for. And I think Bonnie is watching us on live stream. We were military kids. Um, my father was a mobile military teacher, instructor. So we traveled all over the country. So Carol was born in Oregon. Victor was born in Mississippi. I was born in the Denver area. And Bonnie in Illinois. Uh, where we woke up that morning might not be where we went to bed that night. If my father got orders, He'd call my mother and he, she would go out and pick up Carol and Victor from the school. And I was already home, but then they would pull the car up, back it up, hook it up to the trailer, kick the blocks out, and they were gone. We were gone. Uh, we had a two-tone green trailer that was, that was pulled around. Now my dad did retire from the Air Force uh, about the time I started going to school. He worked at various military and space contracting companies, but we moved from Illinois to California to Seattle to Denver to Daytona Beach, Norman Beach to Huntsville and to Cocoa Beach. I counted that I had been in nine different schools before high school. So with all the changes going on, having an older sister like Carol, an older brother like Victor, and even a younger sister like Bonnie were the constants we had. And the Hayes kids, we hung together. Uh, we always often remember the great fights we had, but we were epically holding together too. 
Uh, this is a great story. We were in Sunnyvale, California, when my father told my brother to shape up or ship out. We shipped out. So we packed our stuff up. Carol, Victor, and I, Bonnie was a little too young to take with us. Not that we were that old. <laughs> our plan was to go to the beach and live on Grunion, not knowing that they didn't run all year long. Uh, we made it to the orchard near our house, watched the taillights of the car go around the orchard many times, and we decided to go back home. Carol was the artistic person in our family. She had a good eye and a great talent. She, uh, she, she helped us make snowflakes fall. We cut them all out, and they all covered the house before our parents got up. Uh, another bonus was school projects. So I can remember the time I needed to make the fort at St. Augustine. There was a night before, and I hadn't made much progress. And Carol got out her paper mache skills, and voila, I had a fort. <laughs> so having an artistic sister certainly helped me out. My brother, in contrast, was a mechanic. And most of the times when he took things apart, he could put them back together. So that was another bonus for me, especially for bicycles that needed to be repaired. Carol was in the art club. Uh, her paintings impressed me and my family. Sometimes I'd even buy supplies so she could paint me a picture because I liked her artwork. Her art teacher was a Seventh-day Adventist. Who would, know, who would have thought that? So we took a club trip up to Camp Kulakwa, which is in High Springs, uh, Florida. Carol did a spatula painting of the spring which hung in our house for years. We could get spontaneous art lectures, art history lectures, uh, from her while riding to the 1958 Chrysler or bicycling with her or sometimes on a motorcycle. Motorcycle, you say? <laughs> what did you guys do on the motorcycle? Well, that's an interesting story. We won a Suzuki motorcycle. The radio, pro radio station that we listened to was running a contest. Uh, for a couple of weeks, you had to count how many times they said the word Suzuki. And we, being the little Hayes family pulled together, we took shifts. We counted them 24 hours a day for the first couple days, and then the radio program got, the radio station got complaints that people were staying up late. So we counted them, and sure enough, they called our house. And as Victor reminded me last night, they got a hold of my mother, and she answered, and they said, you've won the Suzuki motorcycle live on the air. And she says, oh, no. <laughs> Oh, no. The motorcycle did lots of good things. Vic, Carol was the first one to uh, have a license to drive it, and Victor has a great story about that, how good she was. But she was also good with me on radio. I got the job as school news reporter from Mainland Junior High School, and I was so nervous that it was hard for me to get up and talk with him, but he would understand. So she got up, and it turned out she sounded just like me, except better. And she taught me to say, this is Charles Hayes reporting from Mainland Junior High School. And it was wonderful. She uh, got me going. Now, my memories of Carol are from the third child perspective. Victor has some different memories. I know that Bonnie has some different ones. And usually from my perspective, I needed someone to be on my side. <laughs> And I often got Carol, and so Victor, Victor would be the other person out there, but sometimes it was Victor. I was only in trouble if I had no one on my side, because I was a third child. She had her um, Hay side, the Scottish-Irish side, came out of her because she ended up with the red hair and fair skin. And she didn't always like that, I don't think, but she turned out pretty good, didn't she, Dennis? Yeah. She got to be Miss Flame at Mainland High School, and I was, uh, I was impressed when she got to ride in the back of a Corvette on a parade, and we have some pictures of that, it was pretty good. After high school, she started at Daytona Beach Junior College. At the meantime, in the meantime, our family was still moving around. We went to Huntsville and Cocoa Beach, and so she took responsibility for her own college. She went to work, she paid for her rent, she paid for all her expenses, she paid for college, and that impressed me that she was so dedicated to her education that she would do all those things. 
And I think at that time, Dennis, she became thrifty. <laughs> yeah, which, as Dennis told me, has lasted throughout her life. <laughs> she was thrifty. After Daytona Beach Junior College, she went off to Stetson, and one of her art professors painted her, and you saw that picture out there of her. Carol's inspiration to me for education began when I was really young because she would read to me before I could read. And I remember saying to her, I bet you know all the words, it's because she had impressed me. And then she would bring books home from school, and I said, I can't wait till I can bring books home from school. And then when it came time for college, I said, Carol went to college, I'm going to go to college. I enjoyed visiting my sister and doing outings with her. Um, we probably thought more alike, which was sort of scary to say, <laughs> than maybe some of the other siblings. But Carol had her opinions, and she thought things through deeply, and those who knew her respected that, that she had thought things through. Uh, Carol married her high school boyfriend out of, out of school, and he had a sick father who couldn't get up, and Carol took care of him for years. Uh, but that marriage did end. She discovered that she was the one supporting the whole family. And uh, there were other things going on, but that ended and went on. But Carol always had a love for camping. She loved getting out outdoors, and she loved Yellowstone. If you saw the introductory slideshow, they're all Yellowstone pictures because she loved that place. Um, she liked the occasional cruise as well. And I, I'm thinking that there were things that really drew her to that. She had a little bit of a spiritual bent in her entire life. I can remember always sort of thinking spiritually about things. But I think going out into nature, not only was it beautiful, but she saw the Creator and was drawn by the Creator. We had the joy of watching Carol meet Jesus Christ in our family. She was in our house a lot of times. She even went through the whole Kenneth Cox series of tapes with us, enjoyed learning more about the Bible, but her joy wasn't just that. Her joy was that she had been set free from the dead of sin. And she, you could see her walking on air when she was just, just thinking about it. She was baptized at National First Seventh-day Adventist Church, and she was confident in Jesus. And Dennis, I think you tell me she was never, never wavered on that, never wavered. So love followed Carol to Dennis. And they met, she met Dennis Kessaroskis, and the name did not scare her off. So, <laughs> and it takes me a little while to learn, it takes us a little while to learn it. Uh, Dennis became her loving husband, and I'm happy to report that Carol and Dennis loved each other all the way. But I'll let him tell more of the love story. Carol and Dennis moved from DeLand to across from the beach and the inland waterway, they could walk on the beach, they could fish, they could kayak, they had a beautiful place there. But Florida gets really hot in the summer. And so what would they do? They would either go north to New England or northwest to uh, Yellowstone. In fact, I saw Carol many times would be, before, before Dennis, she would camp all the way there and she'd probably camp with you too. You know, she'd go, she, she didn't mind, she loved camping. So she'd camp all the way there. She'd get, they'd get a job out at Yellowstone, and they would spend the summer there, free time, just to join Yellowstone, but working, working to make sure that everyone else would have a good time while they were there. It seems like they could face anything together. And one of the things that impressed me was how Carol and Dennis united when Dennis ended up with uh, two cancers. And they, they fought through that together, and they're victorious. So that's why it's so surprising to be here today, because we thought they would keep on facing things and get through them all the time. We have been blessed to know and love Carol. She was a great sister to her siblings, a close cousin and friend to Sue and her husband Al, a loving wife to Dennis, a good sister-in-law to his siblings, and I think that's why we have Charles and Kyle here a good friend to have, 
and an aunt who apparently passes on her genetics to me, to, her, to my kids and my grandchildren. But what we're most thankful for today is that she knew Jesus. Jesus drew her to him. She believed and trusted in him, and she is safe in his care until that great reunion day when the dead in Christ will rise. And we hope that you will all join us in that reunion. We're now going to show a, a little slideshow of uh, Carol's life in pictures. And I'll turn that over to uh, David.
The one on the right. Is this one? Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, I, I uh, have a few memories. One of the first memories I had of Carol was when I was about three years old. And uh, <clears throat> she was going to kindergarten. And she walked to school. One day I followed her to school. Now, my mother didn't know this, that I was going to school. But I followed her to school. And uh, they had swings, you know. I was, on the, I was on the swings, and the bell rang, and I wanted to keep swinging, and the teacher told me to go home. So even though I was three years old, I found my way home. It wasn't a problem. <laughs> yeah. We were the last f free generation. We only had to be home for dinner. They didn't, my parents didn't care as long as we didn't get in trouble. They didn't care. We wandered all over the place. Anyway, um, speaking of school, uh, well, no, before school. And uh, Carol was probably about six or seven years old. Uh, we had, um, we were living in a trailer park, and how about that, a trailer park? A little two-tone green trailer. And there was a big field, grassy field out, and there was a 55-gallon drum out there in that field. And you know how, uh, how lumberjacks, how they roll the logs and everything? You know, you get up on it and roll it. Well, she was, she was up there. She was actually pretty athletic. And uh, my mother said, don't do that, you're going to get hurt. Well, <laughs> Carol was rolling that barrel, and she, uh, I think she was rolling it backwards. Anyway, she jumped off backwards. And you know, uh, us Hayes kids, we had strong bones. We never broke any bones, but she broke her wrist. And she was so afraid that Mother would be mad at her for disobeying her. But uh, yeah, she broke her wrist. And I think that's the only broken bone any of us kids ever had. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when we were in Colorado, you know, my, my son asked me, uh, did they have cars when you were a kid? <laughs> I said, yeah, they had cars, but you know, they were antique cars, you know. They had a, a 57 Plymouth and a 58 Chrysler. <laughs> yeah, in Colorado. And you know, it, it's uh, reputed to get kind of cold there. Sometimes they get down to even 30 below. And they never, choke, they never close the schools. The cars may not run, but guess what? If the cars weren't running, you walked to school. Didn't matter if it was 20 or 30 below. You just bundled up and you walked to school. Well, this one day, and remember Carol carried her books, right? We were walking home from school and we thought it was pretty warm, it was sunny, but it was actually about 10 below. And she actually got, a, uh, one of her fingers got frostbitten. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so much for school stories. Yeah, and we, we ganged up together and we got a motorcycle, but Carol was the only one who had, was old enough to have a permit. And uh, a small motorcycle like that, you could ride with a permit back in those days. You had to be at least 15 years old. So Charlie and I were not in the loop right away. And uh, so Carol took, took me out for a ride. Uh, she was, you know, you know how clutches are, you know, how uh, if any of you, when you learn how to drive on a standard shift, some of the older people do know what a standard shift is. They don't, mostly automatics nowadays, but uh, if you, if you, there's a real tendency to let the clutch out, and as soon as it starts to grab a little bit, you let it out all the way. Real tendency to do that. Uh, well, Carol was having a problem with that, so we stopped at a stoplight, and 
She let the clutch out a little too quick and the, and the motorcycle stalled. And of course, there's cars behind us wanting to go, right? So that's put some pressure on. She's already so she's starting to panic a little bit. We got the motorcycle going. And she wasn't going to stall at this time, so she really opened the throttle up, right? And when she let the clutch out this time, it didn't stall. But boy, it sure did a wheelie. And uh, I was about six inches from the ground. I was riding on the back. So I just thought, I think I'll get off. And I did. I just dropped off on the pavement. And uh, she pulled the clutch in, but she didn't let off on the throttle. She pulled the clutch in, in front of the motorcycle came back down. But then she let the clutch back out. And she did this four or five times, and she kind of went around in a circle. And I saw she was going to come, and she was going to run over me. Then I'm crawling as fast as I can across the pavement. Sure enough, she ran over me. <laughs> <laughs> she, she said, oh, I thought I ran over him. Well, you know, it didn't even hurt. The motorcycle only weighed about 150 pounds, you know. And, it, and she ran across my legs. but. Uh, after that, you know, pretty much uh, she started school. We, w we didn't have too much going on together. But uh, anyway, that's from our young, what do you call it, childhood. Yes. Dennis, you have, you have stories from when you were young together, right? It says Dennis Kassaroskas. Kessler Roskis. See, I can pronounce it. Life story. Do you have a life story, Dennis? I have a life story. With, with Carol? Excuse me? Five. Five? Five. Good job. Good job, Charles. You really did a nice job. I like getting this all set up. Thank you for all for coming. Some of you didn't know, Carol. <laughs> what? Um, like I say, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, I'm sure some of you came from a great distance. The tulips are because uh, we were married on 2 2000, 2 o'clock, February 2nd at 2000, and that's where we had the tulips. And uh, two lips, two lips. <sighs> I have down here, she loved to cook. And she was a good cook. And she loved to grill. And every weekend, we'd break out the grill and cook. She was very meticulous. She had a certain way of doing things. Wanted them done right. in everything. Uh, we would start to get up in the morning and I'd make the coffee and we'd come out and watch TV. We'd watch the Weather Channel. And uh, it was
was her favorite thing to, our favorite thing to do. And naturally, she had to critique the ladies and the guys. She shouldn't be wearing that. It's too tight or too loose. Or she's going to be pregnant, or she is pregnant. She was right most of the time. And, uh, and in the app, I'd go away and do something. We'd come back in the afternoon for lunch. And uh, she would watch TV again with her. And uh, one of her show, favorite shows was How It Was Made. She loved to learn something every day. She was happiest when she learned something every day that she didn't know. And she would watch these shows and she would learn something that she had not known. <sighs> and in the evening for dinner, we'd watch Mythical Morning. It's on YouTube. Two guys from Georgia, North Carolina, were the stars of a show. Two friends grew up together. And for 30 years, or 50 now, and they've been on for 30 years. And they have a bigger viewership almost than anybody. Some would be right of seeing their show. And uh, naturally, she had to say something. She had a favorite, and not a favorite. And I say, Carol, they got to be different for the show. And that's, she would say, well, I don't like him. Uh, Charles covered a lot of about what we did with kayaking and camping. We went from a tent to another tent, a bigger tent, to a pop-up, to a travel trailer, to a motorhome. She told me one day, I just don't want to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and go to the bathroom. I walked to the bathroom which was far away. So we got a motorhome because it had a bathroom. Uh, I think I would like to end it with was, what do I got here? Oh, Carol has left us, but she will never be gone to me. She was in my hands, and I was in hers. <sighs> now she is in God's hands, and it is, and it is, and it is his, his turn to take care of her, as he has done all her life. So I'm like, again, I want to thank you for all for coming to the service. Uh, about the service, when Charles came down to see me in Florida and stay with me, helped me get through the first several days, we went to my church and we talked to the deacon and the deacon was very good. Charles liked him. And, uh, and he went through what he wanted to do and how it was and this and that and so forth. And then Charles said, well, I'm pretty sure Victor will come. 
to Florida. And I'm pretty sure he would come and his wife and fam some of his family. And it came to me, and I says, why not have it here in Tennessee at his church? He's a deacon, a very religious person. People are fortunate to have Charles, good guy. Uh, and of course, I want to thank Pete for being with me. But that's where I had the idea. I said, we'll just have it here. And it's worked out so well. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much, Dennis, for sharing, Victor, and uh, Charlie. It's meant a lot to us to get to know Carol a little bit better here this afternoon, and I just want to let you know how sorry I am for this terrible, unexpected loss, and uh, I know how painful it is when you are struck with a loss in an unexpected way. As I thought about what to share with you, I, my mind immediately turned to the coming of Jesus. The coming of Jesus is filled with so much hope and so much promise, and it's filled with hope and promise and comfort, particularly when we are facing the tragic loss of someone we love. Jesus, in His most famous sermon, made the simple statement, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And those are not just words. Jesus wasn't blowing smoke. When Jesus promised comfort, when we mourn, there was something of substance there. There was something solid there. And the substance and the the, the, the foundational thing that was there was the simple fact that He was going to confront death face to face, eye to eye, and conquer it by resurrecting from the dead. All throughout the New Testament, we have incredible messages of hope. Everywhere you look, everywhere you turn, in fact, when you, when you think to yourself, well, what should I share? You're not… the hard part is fi figuring out what not to say, because on every page there are promises of hope and encouragement. Peter, First Peter. Peter was one of the earliest followers of Jesus. He was there from the beginning, seeing the miracles of Jesus, following Jesus place to place. He was there while Jesus was crucified. Peter was there. Sunday, Resurrection Day, when he saw Jesus alive. This is what he says, "'Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead.'" I, I love this text. It's, it's, there's this living hope that lives inside of us because of the resurrection of the dead. The, the resurrection of Je the dead fills us, of Jesus from the dead, fills us with a living hope. Why? Because He has birthed us into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. I, I, I love this. He, 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 he is singing praise to God, and He's singing praise to God because through the resurrection of the dead, of Jesus from the dead, we have been born 
into a living hope that gives us an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And here we are today mourning the loss of someone who perished, our dear sister, our wife, our great aunt. But there is an inheritance for her kept in heaven that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Through faith, we are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Someday, hopefully soon, Jesus will come and the great salvation that He has accomplished will be revealed. In the meantime, we are prepared and protected by our faith. And then He says this, in all of this, you greatly rejoice, even though right now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. I love what the New Testament does. The New Testament often couples the hope that we have, the joy that we have, the assurance that we have with the reality of the suffering and the trials that we bear right now. In other words, it's not this um, syrupy, sickening sweet hope. It's not a Thomas Kincaid painting that's all light and no darkness. As a husband, I can't imagine the darkness and the emptiness that you must hurt with. As a baby brother, right, whose big sister came to his rescue, right? As uh, you imagine, racing around on the motorcycle behind your sister, even though she was kicking you off while she was pulling wheelies accidentally, right? It hurts. And Peter acknowledges that even though Jesus has come and died and resurrected and we are filled with hope and we have an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, it's safe and secure with Jesus in heaven, and that right now through our faith we are, we are protected, even then we rejoice in all of this, even though right now, for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Jesus promises that when we mourn, we will find comfort, and the reason that we will find comfort is because Jesus has confronted death and overcome it, and it gives us hope and certainty that we have an inheritance that will never perish, will never fade, and that is absolutely secure. Even though we're waiting for it, it's absolutely secure, and we can rejoice somehow, some way, even in our grief. We had a scripture reading earlier, First Thessalonians. I would like to read it again. First Thessalonians is um, a passage about grief, and it says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. I find great comfort in the promise that, or in the scriptural teaching, as you mentioned, Victor, that death is asleep. I remember when I was a boy, my grandfather died, and uh, they told me my granddad was looking down on me, and I kind of got embarrassed every time I went to the bathroom. The New Testament teaches that when a person dies, they, they go to sleep. And then he says, and, and I want you to understand something, he says, I don't want you to grieve like everybody else does because they have no hope. 
But we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe God will bring with Him all those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. According to the Lord's Word, we tell you that we who are still alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with the loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And then it ends this chapter with these beautiful words, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort and hope go together. Comfort and hope go together in our grief, in our heartbreak, in our sorrow, in our great loss, we have the promise Jesus has been where Carol is and has conquered death and has given us a secure inheritance that cannot perish, it cannot fail, it cannot fade. It is absolutely certain. And so even in our grief, we find comfort. Even in our grief, we find hope. My prayer for you, each one of you, is that as you grieve and you hurt and you cry and you mourn, that you will look to Jesus and you will find in His destruction of death, His victory over sin and death, that you will find great comfort and hope in His resurrection and the promise of His soon return. I can't wait to hear the grandkids sing Amazing Grace. I can just bring the microphone to you, friend. Well, for one thing, she didn't like Thomas Kincaid. Oh, <laughs> neither do I. I will. Carol was an art critic. Uh, I wanted to add that when, uh, we did, when I decided that that was no longer going to wait because there was no hope, she was just uh, time for her to go to pass on, we, they unplugged her, took all the tubes out, and they had many of them, like 12 of them, and machines running all over the place. And they unhooked it all, and I went out of the room. Then when I came back, you could see a glow on her face. Almost a smile. It looked like she was so relieved of all that was going on. And you, you could just tell she was in a better place. I don't know how else to say it, but she just, she looked so good for being in such a situation. And so I feel good about it. I feel she's all right. Like I said, she's in God's hands now. Thank you. It's a hard decision t that you made, and it's a blessing that you found a signal of comfort and hope in that difficult decision you had to make. It's beautiful. Sound that saved us. 
for all of the hope and the promises, for the amazing grace that you have shown us in Jesus, for the beautiful life that Carol lived and the impact that she made. Father, today we pray that when the darkness of death brings pain and heartache to us, that the light of the resurrection would bring hope and joy even in the midst of ongoing suffering. God, may you bless us, and as we go to our fellowship, may your blessing attend us there with beautiful stories and relationship, and we thank you for always taking care of our needs in every way, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to let you know that as you exit this door, you can turn to your right and follow it down the hall to the meal and the fellowship time. 